Attention Talking Simpsons listeners, we have a special mini-series just for you. We're going through the entire first season of King of the Hill, and you can only hear it if you're a $5 and up patron at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. We're giving the Talking Simpsons treatment to all 13 episodes of King of the Hill's first season, and if you want a free sample, you'll find the first episode available for free in the Talking Simpsons feed. Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. It's the only place you'll find the first season of Talk King of the Hill. Man, you go click, 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 click. It's real easy, man. I heartily endorse this event or product. Ahoy hoy everybody, welcome to Talking Simpsons, the podcast that will self-destruct unless properly stored. I'm your host, two guys from Quantico Delivery Boy, Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons. Who else is here with me today? Fan of Castro Street, Henry Gilbert. And who do we have on the line? Hi, I'm Amber Lee Frost from Chapo Trap House. Today's episode is The Trouble with Trillions. Oh, will this horrible year never end? We've never lost a year before, and I'll be damned if we're going to lose one on my shift. Today's episode aired on April 5th, 1998, and as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real-world history. <gasps> oh my god! Oh boy, Bobby, singers Tammy Wynette and Wendy O. Williams both pass away. The Lost in Space movie debuts in theaters, and the Dow Jones hits an all-time high as unemployment reaches the lowest since 1970, an economic bliss that I'm sure will never end. No, we're living it right now, <laughs> yeah. in the aftermath. <laughs> Uh, all I know about Wendy O. Williams is that a Koopa kid is named after her. And yes. that's basically uh, where yeah, it ends. Yeah, that's actually the Koopa kid that looks like me. <laughs> oh, wow. Just, this is like a very famous thing when people were trying to figure out my celebrity doppelgangers. And I don't have any human celebrity doppelgangers. <laughs> I look like Janice from The Muppets and I look like Wendy Koopa. Are you wearing the giant bow right now in your hair? <laughs> That's between me and the walls. Okay. Uh, in the Lost in Space movie, I did see it in theaters. It was weird to see. They, it was the. I think the last time they tried to push Matt LeBlanc as like a guy who could star in movies. It just it all failed out. We're post Ed. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This, I thought so. Well, they thought like, what if we packaged him as an ensemble role with a bunch of other more famous people that people like and Mimi Rogers, all that stuff. But no, it just it didn't take. And now there's. I, a- I think I remember that was uh, during the era when I was figuring out that a lot of these sort of nostalgia reboots were very cynical and <laughs> when I started to develop a distaste for a lot of the cheap moves of mass culture. <laughs> and it's recently been brought back again for Netflix as a prestige <laughs> series and yes, people yeah. swear to me it's good but they swear to me lots of things are good that I haven't watched on Netflix so uh, I'll, yeah. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I mean it, I basically wait until people aren't excited about a show anymore to give it a try because you just really can't figure out anything through the zeitgeist. And a lot of people will be really obsessed with the show. And then you can ask them like a year later and you're like, was that actually that good? And they're like, I can't even remember what I watched. It's just, yeah. they're just making so much media. I put off, always available. I put off watching Stranger Things for so long that it's bad now. Yeah. And I save so much time. Yeah. If, yes, it's bad. I always knew it was bad. I mean, I was like uh, completely obligated to watch it because it's set in Indiana when I grew up, but it is bad. (laughs) (laughs) Amber, welcome to the show. You're our third Chapo-ite who's done the show, so welcome. Yeah, yeah. Excited to be here. It's interesting. Like, The Simpsons is probably, like, we have a lot of, you know, overlapping, like, comedic influences, obviously, on the show, but The Simpsons is probably, if you want to go Frankfurt School, like, the primary (laughs) text that like we all share and and hold very dear to our hearts yeah i think uh, maybe felix is the one who doesn't reference the show or references it way less than you guys but you're he all... very infrequently does yeah. but osmosis wise he is very much influenced by it hmm. he's a little bit he's the youngest one of us so that's part of it but yeah he also makes sense and style jokes i think without even necessarily being aware of it i mean like we're, we're not like a scripted show or anything but like the idea that the joke writing is really sort of frenetic and referential and uh, irreverent uh, like there are definitely like jokes that I could see that I'd be like that look that sounds like a Felix joke <laughs> well I think per capita of the hosts you you do the most Simpsons references I think on Chapo really I would think it would be Matt 
I think um, you're the dark horse on that. Mm. That's, uh, the deeper maybe. references. It, it is like at this point, like a, like a knee jerk thing. Cause like I said, it is kind of the primary text, but like I do it. I, I, I do it a lot. It's a really holdover, like kind of nerd thing that I can get away with. Cause I'm a cute girl, but it would be really annoying if I weren't. It's very useful shorthand in this era of politics, especially as white supremacy is flourishing. I enjoy hearing the quiet part loud and the loud part quiet. <laughs> yeah, That's uh, yeah, a very yeah. useful shorthand for how uh, things are being communicated. Well, and Amber, you're a writer, scholar, political activist, professor, inventor of the term dirtbag left. I, <laughs> so, so many great things. How, how did Simpsons, you know, influence you politically? Politically, it probably didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more the sort of context of my life formed my politics. But I do remember my mother picking me up from daycare when The Simpsons first started because I, I had a mom with good taste. Not a cool mom, not like an Amy Poehler and Mean Girls cool mom, but she was, I had, I had a young mom and she was like a Gen X, like an older Gen X person, single mom. And she would pick me up and like literally be like, it's Thursday night, you know what's on? And then uh, we would sing the theme song for The Simpsons, which only has two words, the and Simpsons. <laughs> Uh, together. So it's like a very, it was like family time for us. And of course, obviously I didn't get a lot of the jokes, but I definitely sort of grew up with it. And there was definitely, it is strange how your relationship to the characters change. Cause when you're young, you think Lisa is the protagonist and Lisa is not the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Lisa is smug and annoying and mm -hmm. you like her, but she's a little bit of a goody goody. And as you get older, you're like, you know, maybe sometimes Bart, but mostly Homer, mm -hmm. <laughs> like Homer and Marge. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a, it was a class politics show. They were, I think the family themselves were sort of the last of a, a certain type of default Democrat that doesn't re that ceased to exist after the 90s you know they were sort of generically pro-union without being sort of precious about it obviously they had the you know very famous union episode um but they would also make fun of lazy teamsters and stuff like that yeah. uh, but always always with great affection and it's interesting when you get older too and you find out how kind of let's say politically idiosyncratic the writer's room was, mm -hmm. but what came out of it was, I think, a pretty sort of coherent amalgam worldview, which mm -hmm. is relatively progressive, kind of benevolent, thinks highly of people, and um, is very concerned with uh, working people. Yeah, the union stuff you mentioned, that was one thing that really struck me in our rewatch of it. 1993 or two episodes, the way they make fun of unions or they're just like, ah, oh, these unions so powerful and annoying. It's just, it feels very odd, especially when it's written by people in a very union field yeah. of Hollywood too. They're very mm -hmm. both sidesy about it. Yeah, well, and also I think people, again, very politically idiosyncratic writer's room. I think people sort of looking at the episodes now try and figure out if the joke is reactionary or not. And I don't necessarily think that's the best way to approach that kind of comedy. I, I like not everything has a hidden meaning or a subtext. Sometimes the joke, I'll, there's an example in this episode. Mm. There is such thing as kind of just a joke. Yeah, the S Surly Teamsters is like one of my favorite and I'm a vulgar workerist. Like <laughs> it's one of my favorite Simpsons jokes. And I think it's done with a, a certain amount of like, like sort of affection. And they're affectionate for the shiftless people like Homer Simpson. Like they, <laughs> the, the show likes people. Before we get into the episode itself, one more question I had. I thought I heard on a recent Chapo, you talked about your, your collection of Simpsons bootleg shirts you own. Oh. I do. As part of my uh, podcast, Billionaire Lifestyle, <laughs> I can now buy extremely dumb collectibles. So in addition to all the uh, roast pheasant and fancy perfumes I get, I collect bootleg Barts, which I keep an eye out for on Etsy. And I've bought enough of them now that Etsy now finds them and suggests them to me. <laughs> wow. um, so I have like quite a few Mexican parts, very, uh, those are pretty easy to find. Jamaican parts are easy to find. I have one that's pretty rare that's Italian and uh, it's Bart spray painting on a wall. And obviously, what do you what do you think he would be spray painting on the wall? It's interesting to me because Cow like, Cowabunga. obviously, <laughs> right. That doesn't translate to Italian. Ah. So what they did is they took a lesser known catchphrase, the I didn't do it and translated oh, it okay. to Italian, ah. which is really, because you can't say like, don't have a cow in Italian. There's right. no... 
idiom for that. But the crown jewel of my collection is I have the Middle East crisis art. Oh, I was going to ask you, how many of these have Saddam Hussein on them? (laughs) Uh, I have one that has Saddam Hussein on on it. Um, It's Black Bart as a Marine strangling Saddam Hussein. Wow. There's like a speech bubble as he's being choked that he's just saying, R, who are you? And <laughs> and Bart, black military Bart, is uh, has a speech bubble that says, don't you ever, and then scribble with me, I am your worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. And at the bottom, it just literally says, Middle East crisis, the day when Bart got really pissed off. <laughs> it wow. makes no sense. I love how uh, artless I love that, that is. these things exist, that the Simpsons became sort of a folk culture product because graining was like not litigious about intellectual property. No, he loved um, uh, collecting bootlegs. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, we kind of took the same approach with Chapo where we're like, look, if you want us to promote like a, you know, like we'll pay someone to make shirts that will sell or whatever. But if someone just wants to make bootleg Chapo shirts and just sell them on their own, like we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it has produced some really cool, funny art. I'm sure at some point it'll produce terrible stuff. Not as much as The Simpsons, because we'd never be that big. But I like that this is something that the culture kind of owned and did sometimes completely stupid, idiotic things with. But it was just like such a phenomenon. I can't think of I can't think of anything comparable to that. <laughs> yeah, there were no like SpongeBob Osama bin Laden t-shirts mm. at my mall. No. Yeah. I mean, I would buy one if <laughs> if I found that, but like <laughs> Uh, and for it to keep going across all these different countries, too, is really strange. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this episode has some interesting uh, background to it. At a certain point in the production of this episode, they wanted it to be about Homer finding out he has a Native American background, a Native American blood. And it was all because Mike Scully was really obsessed with having a third act where Homer leads a Native American revolt against Springfield. <laughs> and it was all rooted in taxes because the idea of the premise was when Homer is Native American, he won't pay taxes. But then they found out that's not true. <laughs> so yeah. They scrapped the yes. story idea entirely. So it turns out they had like seven jokes about Cuba. So that's what the third act is <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. And you can kind of tell, I mean, this is, this is getting to the point in the series. I, I was actually, I was really happy you did uh, the Bush episode with Virgil and Matt, because like that is, I think, very formative for me. It was the first episode I remember seeing. And because, you know, when you're like a kid, you like a show or a book series or something and you're a completist and you think of it is one big thing and you either like it or you don't. And then I think that's the first Simpsons episode I saw where I'm like, that was not a very good episode of my favorite show. (laughs) It was polarizing even back then. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you get into maybe this era of the Simpsons and (laughs) they're starting to get a little less. I mean, I watched I watched well into the double digit seasons for quite a while, but like that's when you start to notice, let's say they're not quite as sparkling or or tight (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, as they once were. This episode still has some, I think, like classic moments, but you can tell that it's sort of tacked on the Cuba thing at the end. Yeah, (laughs) this episode is really more about gags than story. It's just full of jokes, which I like. Yeah, it grows so big in where it goes from tax day. It's it's pretty extreme. But I I also was surprised. uh, Well, actually, it's funny that that really puts this in a pre-internet age, the writing of the script, too, that they just have they have this old wives tale of, oh, you know, Native Americans don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How does that go? They would they would get away with all those jokes in a later episode, though. So don't oh, worry. Oh, they saved them yeah. all for their. I mean, everybody did the Indian Casino episode. Every cartoon mm-hmm. did. So I don't fault them. It was a, it was a style at the time. Mm-hmm. But I also was surprised that this episode that's all like taxes theft was not written by uh, Schwarzwalder. I in my memory I was like, oh yeah, Schwarzwalder wrote this. Me one. too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it wasn't particularly rough on that stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. It was ambivalent, right? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of ambivalence in, in kind of that, that Simpsons show where it's like, we're going to go scene by scene. So I don't want to like jump the yeah. gun on this. But yeah, like it's not, it's not a reactionary show. Even when, when there are reactionary jokes from say the most reactionary writer, like it's still kind of, it, it ends up on the pro working class side of the ledger. Yeah. By giving Burns the most anti-tax speeches, you're not, you're <laughs> never supposed to agree with Burns on the show. That's not the stance of the Simpsons. So I mean, Homer does though, and he's well, an idiot. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His sympathies turn on a dime. Uh, and it was fun to watch this episode too, uh, around tax 
tax day because uh, we just had the fun of paying our taxes. Uh, Patreon income is very fun to pay taxes on, especially as I'm sure you know, Amber. That's how, how it goes. The only thing that brings me down about taxes is just knowing it pays for military stuff. I'm like, I can't this probably food. That's which is one of the jokes. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, true. In there, yeah. Do nothing nuclear missiles. Tomb polish. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> this episode oh yeah it was brian scully they said that came up with the trillion dollar bill turn for this one it's that, pretty clever i like that yeah yeah but ian and max stone Graham, we talked about it before you know i've been super negative to him because he was the guy who wrote the mod murder episode mm-hmm. but, but this one's funny he also does come off as a bit of a classist sexist in interviews but i do this is a funny episode i, I have to give it to mm-hmm. uh, but okay why don't we get into the episode itself so it was always a surprising one when i'd watch it in my tapes that it begins with new year's eve i'm like wait what episode is this yeah and then we're suddenly in april i love this beginning actually um because i'm a big proponent of the idea of like three springfields <laughs> like i believe that there are three springfields that they sort of invoke whenever they talk about the town and i like the fact that they talk about the town as a as a sort of character in and of itself <laughs> but there's the um there's the fools and rubes Springfield, hmm. who like elect Homer sanitation commissioner or buy a, a, a monorail from a huckster. Mm-hmm. There's the cruel and vicious kind of mob Springfield who <laughs> beat a bunch of snakes to death in the middle of the uh, town square or leave a little boy to like rot in a well. <laughs> and then there's like the heartwarming fellowship Springfield where, oh, like they left the, b- the bomb shelter to go face the, you know, a, a meteor death. Mm-hmm. with Flanders and this one starts out as Fellowship Springfield but then the joke turns into Fools and Rubes Springfield <laughs> they're very fickle people yeah yeah I, yeah well I, I think I think the writers ultimately like they're they're ambivalent about crowds mm-hmm. who can be like cruel and stupid mobs but it's not a misanthropic show they I think they kind of see the purpose of civil society I mean this is overthinking it of course but like <laughs> the purpose of civil society is to like make sure the mob doesn't do idiotic or cruel things. <laughs> I love their cheers of the burning city hall. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any reaction of yay to an inappropriate thing is great. Yes. Uh, but yes, let's hear uh, as everyone else is celebrating. Ned is Ned is getting hard at work. Yeah, boy, that mm-hmm. sounds bad too. <laughs> Ned Ned's working hard. Here's the clip. <laughs> Well, he's in bed, of course, obviously. <laughs> yes, yeah. He he went to bed hours ago. That's yeah. What, after I, some ice milk. I love that he, he goes to bed before New Year's, but will wake up at midnight. So I was like, you could have just stayed up till midnight. And No, he could have. <laughs> that would have been unseemly. Yeah, dinner at 4, went to bed at 5.30. Oh, January 1st. Better get going on those taxis, Nettie. Hmm. Let's see, cash register ink. Well, <laughs> that's a business expense, isn't it? I, oh, but then I do enjoy the smell of this stuff, don't I? <laughs> Better not risk it. Daddy, what do taxes pay for? Oh, why everything. Policemen, trees, sunshine. And let's not forget the folks who just don't feel like working, God bless them. Nettie, it's 845. The post office is going to be opening soon. 845? Here I am, yapping away like it's 835. <laughs> Can't forget the mints. Get your taxes out of the way? No, just mailing out death certificates for holiday related fatalities. <laughs> Yes, uh, I've now learned the joys of writing things off thanks to yeah. our lovely accountant. <laughs> right, right. They, you... Yeah, so that's one of those jokes that like could have very well been interpreted as reactionary because mm-hmm. uh, he starts out with only play for police, but then trees, sunshine, and then the people that just don't want to work. God bless him. But like, if you take that really seriously, and that's supposed to be like the sentiment of the show, then you've completely ignored the fact that like the show loves shiftless people yeah like it love homer simpson but we can still laugh about it it's fine it really yeah. is and if you just consider consider the source it's ned he's like a condescending christian mm. yeah <laughs> and i love that like low-key judgmental you know vibe you have to ned where there's like obviously like this seething secret resentment he has for other people which just happens in a few episodes where he kind of like explodes he actually is kind of a judgmental prick he's just extremely 
chipper and committed to this affect of Christian mercy <laughs> because his parents were hippies <laughs> and he had to rebel in some way. He has accepted that folks who don't feel like working will get money and he's just <laughs> like, well, it's just how it goes. I uh, gotta just yeah. smile through it. Yeah, I also, I like that he's such a nerd. He, he If he gets a slight amount of enjoyment from yeah. something, he can't write it off. I should have put mints in our check we mailed to the IRS. I forgot to do that. It was all digital for me, so uh, I don't know what I would okay. do. I like licking those. Actually, no, you don't lick stamps anymore. It was a self adhesive one too a lot of licking uh, sound effects in this episode yeah the foley <laughs> artist just really busy <laughs> oh yeah right before this i meant to mention too in the uh when everybody's singing old lang Zai, uh, oh yeah i want uh, yeah i noticed this the for, for the first time nelson actually. nelson and kearney <laughs> they're drinking yeah. nelson's kind of uh one of them is pouring something off screen like just off screen i think they're just getting away with that yeah. joke <laughs> it goes by so fast and maybe i'd always been watching crusty because you hear him just like uh, yeah. like i yeah. looked right at him so i never noticed nelson drinking it's a bit of a risque joke for the for the show especially at that point yeah they, i guess they could hide it in the crowd well we just did das bus and he wanted delicious wine on the island so <laughs> he he's an it. alcoholic we discovered it <laughs> he should have learned from his mother's cough drop prediction not, <laughs> uh but no it, to be extra pedantic ned the joke's on him because the post office is closed on january 1st he'd been in just the same if he mailed it on january 2nd mm. Right, right. But I guess God would know if he'd not done yeah. the first. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the Simpsons will be right back. This isn't the line for Metallica. This is Henry Gilbert saying thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Talking Simpsons. And a big thank you to our guest, Amber Lee Frost from the Chapo Trap House podcast. We are so happy to have her on here and to share her Simpsony memories and thoughts with us. And we hope you guys enjoyed it too. And if you'd like to hear next week's episode a week ahead of time and at free, you could hear it right now if you signed up at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Now I'm sure you know what Patreon is. It is a wonderful crowdsourcing system to subscribe to podcasts like ours and if you sign up at the five dollar level you will support me and bob doing this full time and also you'll get so many extras like hearing every episode of talking simpsons a week ahead of time and ad free doing the same for our sister podcast what a cartoon where me and bob talk about a different animated series each week as in-depth as we do on talking simpsons and that's just the beginning you'll also get access to dozens of exclusive patreon only podcasts like Many interviews with creators who have worked on The Simpsons, in some cases from the very first short, plus exclusive miniseries where me and Bob do the Talking Simpsons treatment to Simpsons adjacent series. We've done it for Talking Critic, the entire series of Critic. We've done it for the first season of Futurama on Talking Futurama, and we just wrapped up the first season of King of the Hill in our miniseries Talk King of the Hill. You can hear all of those only if you are a $5 and up patron with tons more exclusives to come you can only hear that one more time if you sign up as a subscriber at patreon.com slash talking simpsons If you happen to be the owner of a trillion dollar bill, you should definitely think about going to the premium level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. That is where for $10 a month, you can hear our monthly What a Cartoon Movie podcast where you get all of our previous $5 and up rewards, but you also get access to the monthly movie podcast where me and Bob talk for over three hours each time about a different animated feature film. What feature films could you already hear us talk about? About? If you sign up right now, Batman Mask of the Phantasm, Kiki's Delivery Service, Akira, A Goofy Movie, The Secret of Nim, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and Aladdin. You'll hear all of those plus many more in the months to come. If you sign up at the $10 and up premium level, it is a great way to support me and Bob and you get tons of content for it plus all of our previous $10 a month stuff which includes us doing commentary on every single Simpsons short from the original run for full Simpsony completeness's sake. You can only see those if you are a $10 and up patron. So please consider going up to the premium level today.
Uh, but yes, then everybody goes to the post office. It does a like a uh, dissolve into April fifteenth, which back to fools and rubes, Springfield. Yes, I I love that uh, it is across like class. Like I guess Burns isn't there, but everybody else is there. No Krusty's matter how. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, Frank, uh, a technocrat. He's there. He still didn't put his uh, mail his yet either. Yeah, and Kent Brockman is punished for his hubris. <laughs> That's great. Which yeah. The Simpsons loves doing those. Those jokes, that's a very favorite kind of joke for them, is someone being smug and then quickly finding out that it's not going to work out for them. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful world where hubris is immediately punished in this <laughs> yeah. universe. I've, I've been to the post office on the 15th. Let me just say I'm a total dweeb uh, who would have a relative do my taxes until a couple, few years ago, so uh, I never took the responsibility to myself. I, I Sorry. But, <laughs> but when I would go to the post office on April 15th a couple times, I would see the people like like all like just sprawled on the floor writing it out there like it it's it's a can be a oh, tense wow. day yeah this is in uh, berkeley california i've seen it so mm. that's uh, yeah this, i'm late on mine this year and that's just <laughs> gonna be how it is <laughs> that's cool we 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 won't tell let's hear some of kent brockman interviewing the uh, the people of springfield this is kent brockman live at the springfield post office on tax day it's literally the 11th hour 10 p.m and tardy taxpayers are scrambling to mail their returns by midnight Sir, why did you wait until the last minute to pay your taxes? Taxes? Isn't this the line from Metallica? Sir, uh, why did you wait until the last minute to pay your taxes? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> Happy? Of course, not everyone is an idiot. Some of us took our receipts and pay stubs to our accountants months ago. And at the risk of sounding a little smug... Oh, help! Does anyone have a calculator? Myron? No. <laughs> Krusty <laughs> sent Ken up for the perfect segue. He did, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm an idiot, all right? He just gives up. He's like, look, I'm an idiot. I would assume Krusty fired his accountant on a tax bender at some point. Oh, wait, he, we already saw his accountant in uh, oh, Homer, right. the, Homie the Clown. That's right, so. when he, yeah, he was betting on the, um, yeah, yeah. He must have fired that guy after that. <laughs> Or he just quit after after the uh, the Harlem Globetrotters thing. Probably <laughs> it was time to quit. Yeah, I also like the the gag of Frank knowing that someone miscalculated from drawing on his back. Just the feeling. Yeah, he's. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and the line it's literal literally the eleventh hour, ten, 10 p.m. Very good. That's a very funny. Line. I feel like David S. Cohen was behind that. Yeah, I think I think so. I feel it's a very Futurama e line. I think mm -hmm. it's also weird that when Otto learns that he's in the wrong line, he, he remains in there. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's committed that long to it i guess that means he either paid his taxes already or he just is below the income level to pay taxes yeah i don't think he's making I, yeah you know some people just don't pay their taxes right yeah i guess so <laughs> yes. uh myron is a very good accountant name i like that I wish we should name our accountant Myron now. Our accountant is, is named John. <laughs> Don't give too many details. <laughs> Not accountanty enough. Yeah. <laughs> I can really identify with Homer in this next scene because I have had that sharp emotional turn of thinking, I'm smarter than everybody else. Oh, no, I'm worse off than them. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite a comeuppance. Will you look at those morons? I paid my taxes over a year ago. Dad. What is it, sweetie? Did you see a scary picture in your picture book? <laughs> that was last year's taxes. You have to pay again this year. No, because, you see, I went ahead and year-wise, I was counting forward from the last previous... Oh! I like Homer's condescension to Lisa to like see a scary picture in your picture book. Yeah, That's Lisa nice. is getting uh, dumped on a lot in these later years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and she's sort of smug and eye rolly too, which yeah. um, you know when you're young and watching it, you're like, oh, clearly, like this is the only smart person in the room or whatever. <laughs> um, but then you become an adult and you have to pay taxes, and you're like, lay off, Lisa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that we're not too far removed from smug atheist Lisa from uh, the, <laughs> this a Angel Skeleton episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think, well, that's really all the space that they have for Lisa or anybody else in this episode, any of the other family members of this episode, to just have, like, a one-off joke. And I think she has some of the best ones in this. Yeah, even though they kind of sell her out at the end. Oh, yeah. It's Big a time. Weird, it's a weird kind of cast show, like a Burns Smithers, I mean, it ends on a, you know, a Burns Smithers homer driven act which is really weird bart is semi-non-existent in this episode <laughs> yeah i think he has too this might be the fewest lines bart's ever had yeah. in an episode i think he does weigh in briefly here as homer <laughs> fills out his taxes i put the tax forms on top of your to-do pile a month ago 
I have a to-do pile? <gasps> March, how many kids do we have? Oh, no time to count. I'll just estimate. Uh, nine. Oh, you know we don't have... Shut up, shut up. If I don't hear you, it's not illegal. Okay, I need some deductions, deductions. Oh, business gifts. Here you go. Keep using nuclear power. Homer, I painted that for you. Okay, Marge, if anyone asked, you require 24-hour nursing care. Lisa's a clergyman. Maggie has seven people, and Bart was wounded in Vietnam. Cool. You really have a lot of talent, kid. So sad. But there was no punchline there. That was just a really dark joke about like Marge's, you know, unfulfilled creative impulses and talents. I mean, it's an ongoing theme in the show. Yeah. um, That she is at many times a bored housewife. And I don't think they treat that as a tragedy, but Mm -hmm. I think they acknowledge that she has like a complicated inner life and she has interests and talents and, you know, she gets, you know, crushes and, you know, has creative projects and, and she has a few ill-fated careers and things (laughs) like that. I think they had a a great, uh, uh, you know, I think the show has a great affection for women and and kind of like um, housewives in general, but oh my gosh, what a weird dark joke to end that like scene on. (laughs) It's an interesting moment where after watching her husband fail spectacularly yet again, she just reflects upon a life that she could have had. Yes. Like, yeah. like, you know, the joke. Was that the origin of that painting, by the way? It's the first time they've yeah. said it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's the first time they refer to the painting. Yeah, I've looked. Like at all. I looked up the history. They In later episodes, they'd give it different background. Like there's one where Lisa is drawing it in a flashback. Mm. And mm-hmm. there's another where it's implied that they have multiple copies that constantly keep getting destroyed as part of Homer's insanity but uh, I like this origin the most that it's just a nice painting Marge gave that Homer completely forgot she even did I enjoy them finding the origins of these very mundane things like the kitchen curtains with the corn on them <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as we yeah. get into these later seasons uh, I mean this one as as a kid when I saw this joke I could only really see it through you know child eyes towards my mom and it just made me think of like <laughs> oh has my mom ever said a sad thing and then I just am like well what do I have what can I comment on this? I'm a child. This is not about Batman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of just a, a wistful sigh from your mom, and you're like, oh, what's going on here? Well, because like the moms that Marge are, you're not supposed to have dreams. Like they, they <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and especially you consider like the time period for this, like things have changed like so rapidly for women and like over the past like 30 years. And the people writing this episode probably had stay-at-home moms. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely feel that, like in in the writing of Marge, which are who I think they're very sympathetic to and allowed to develop. And that the um, the strategy of writing things plot based and kind of reverse engineering, it, I, I think the show accidentally became character driven because they they were like, okay, well, we're going to write wacky plots and write jokes around it or whatever, and then the the characters kind of. T- developed after they adapted to that like writing style but for marge like it's clearly like a bunch of people thinking about their mothers and creating a composite (laughs) like put upon housewife yeah she is the mom of the 60s filtered through these uh, 90s writers heads (laughs) totally totally yeah i did want to mention the car accident that homer gets into on the way to the post office (laughs) so when simpson tied we saw him murder a man on screen i think for the first time yeah that car gets vaporized that is a hilariously gruesome car accident he causes it's at that so, crosswalk. Yeah. Oh god, that, that car gets T-boned and like completely Just, like yeah. shattered more than any car normally would be in that kind of accident. It's like extra gruesome just so you the know. The animation is almost weird like yeah. how crushed it is. Just so you can be sure, multiple people <laughs> died in that. But, but Bob, you legally have no leg to stand on. He didn't look. That's he true. didn't see, so it's not a crime. Though Homer is a good legal mind later when he points out that Marge's name was on it too. Like, she should be in just as much trouble because of this. But yes, Homer drives through, and I counted it. They, they, it is 12 chimes of the bell. Mm. It is accurate. They, when, though, it, I mean, it's impressive that the post office stays open till midnight in, uh, in Springfield as well. Yeah. What is this post office? <laughs> and there are these weird rules like it has to be in the bin or it won't be mailed. No one yes. will pick it up off the floor. I like that. The, yeah. 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 These stakes are only in Homer's mind. Like, I have to get it in the bin. Uh, but it's fun. It, it is, is fun. fun. And uh, the randomness of, of how it's decided who's audited it's how i've always imagined it does work at the real irs it's just you're the uh, one unlucky person who fell in that trough of a uh, severe audit i mean there is a random
random audit. Yeah. Uh, though we talked too about how June Foray got audited. The voice actress June Foray, she got audited for like a decade straight because right. she was on Nixon's enemies list. Yeah. Well, I used to work for an organization called Democratic Socialists of America, mm. and we got audited yearly. Mm. Oh, how how random. <laughs> how random. Yeah. <laughs> Damn that number generator. <laughs> Uh, the guys are talking about what they do with One Wish, which uh, Joey Heatherton, I had to look up. I didn't know who she was. I just knew her I from uh, being mentioned, being at like Bob Hope USO shows. Ah, okay. <laughs> I mean, she's definitely the type of uh, sexy dame of the 60s and 70s Bob Hope would have been in love with, for sure. Uh, Playboy model. But she's still with us, 74 today. Mm. But uh, that really dates <laughs> Moe's uh, libido there. That really does. <laughs> I do enjoy Lenny's low effort wish. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. I love the the you know Stein Becky and Cannery Row bar flies. Um, <laughs> they, they just they just don't have a lot of ambitions. They're just kind of like good guys that get drunk on the weekends and like that would be, for example, something that. I don't know if you refer to this specifically, but that's like a Felix joke. The guy who's like an iron, an iron shirt. <laughs> uh, that is, yeah, that it is like him. That yeah. is a real Felix construction of a gig. <laughs> I also love how nonplussed they are at Homer being dragged away by the IRS. Seems like people get dragged out of yeah, those yeah. a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, that's the first of many times. Uh, so we go to commercial, we come back, and Homer is waiting for his turn of his audit. With him is it's Lucius Sweet, yeah. not Don King. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like Don King and sounds just like him. There, that's the late Paul Winfield doing his voice for one line. Uh, my guess is they made sure to have Paul Winfield do it because some lawyer told them, like, if it's not clearly the guy from the previous episode, Don King could sue us over license, a he likeness. Has, he has tax problems like Don King, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this, there would be, I'm sure he's litigious. Oh, yeah. yeah. And this is the version of Gil they really lean into. Like, if you look yeah. at his previous two appearances. Oh, I love Gil. Gil he, is, like, one of my all-time favorite. <laughs> like, I mean, like, to take, like, that nervous Jack Lemon character and just eject him into, like, various situations, it's, like, never not funny to me. <laughs> this is, like, Gil steps away from death row, Gil. And in mm. the previous appearances, he was, like, sort of halfway to where he is in this episode. And from this episode, he only get more desperate. Like, I feel like they found <laughs> yeah. the Gil they wanted. It's a continuing degradation of him yes yeah i know i i, I really love it and, and then I, I like i had never seen like i didn't obviously i don't understand these kind of like stock characters or archetypes or anything at the time but like i remember seeing glenn gary glenn ross like as an adult and being like oh <laughs> <laughs> this might be my line in the episode just because i say i definitely say put in a good word for old blank <laughs> yeah uh, quite a lot mm-hmm. this yeah. is an egregious miscarriage of taxitude Oh, this is bad. This is really bad. You work and you slave and you steal just enough for a sweet lick of that shiny brass ring. Don't I get a lick? Doesn't Gil get a lick? Simpson, Homer J. <laughs> hey, put in a good word for old Gil, would you? Yeah, his res- his resentment <laughs> is really bleeding through. Yeah, before yeah. he could cover it up. Yeah, no, I love it. I love also the kind of malevolent bureaucrats which are kind of another constant Simpsons thing. Like oh, yeah. it's very intimidating by bureaucrats, very intimidated by kind of like the opacity of these structures. There's there's a bit of Kafka anxiety to all of this mm. stuff. Like it's like you don't know how much trouble you're in yeah. and you don't know what they're going to do to you and you're not smart enough to think your way out of it. <laughs> these guys do it like every job for the IRS. They interview Homer, <laughs> they show him the film, they yeah, yeah. are monitoring it's him the surveillance a intimidating suits yeah. yeah and they also fly a plane at the end of the episode <laughs> these guys are working hard they're working hard for their money yeah you know talking about selling out guilt too this is the first time he's committed a crime like in his previous ones he's like he's just bad at his job and very put upon but in this one he's like yeah. i embezzled tons of money and gambled on it <laughs> He got desperate. That's that's the character of Gil. He's pushed to the edge. <laughs> Homer is getting interviewed by those scary IRS men, and uh, in this in this next clip, I really love the childishness of his apology. Yeah. 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 Mr. Simpson, this government computer can process over nine tax returns per day. Did you really think you could fool it? No, oh, sir. I'm really sorry, sir. An older boy told me to do it. You're looking at five years minimum. No, sir, please. I can't go to prison. They pee in a cup and throw it on you. I saw it in a movie. You won't be seeing any prison movies where you're going. 
Prison. <laughs> no, please don't do anything. Anything? Well, let's just start. Agent Johnson, FBI. I'm very happy to meet you. From now on, you're going to work for us. Okay, but could you pay me under the table? I got a little tax <laughs> problem. I, I enjoy knowing that Agent Johnson was waiting on the other side of that chair. The, the entire, rare double-sided chair. Du- I love that double-sided chair. Um, and the, the childishness like of his response and then that like dumb kind of vaudeville exchange, which... Like a lot of like, you know, going straight to the I have a little tax problem thing. <laughs> like a lot of these jokes feel like very like 1940s fast talky vaudeville jokes. Oh, yeah. Which which is like it's weird that they even even into the later seasons that this, the thing they keep going as that kind of joke style becomes even more and more anachronistic. <laughs> yeah, there were joke styles last heard on the radio, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I love I love it. I think it's really funny. I like that kind of an anachronism, but it is really weird. There's also a bizarre thing in the scene that somebody points out on the commentary. It's, it's Ian Maxstone Graham. I never caught yeah. it until he pointed it out. Uh, yeah. Homer's bundle of tax stuff turns into a ball of string for like one shot and then back into the ball of tax stuff. Yes. I don't get it. Is there a cut scene maybe? Who I knows? Think but it's, it's just a weird animation goof. One of the weirdest ones. Like they just... You somebody... can't accidentally draw a ball of string. It has to be like a joke. I don't know. I think it could have just been a miscommunication on prop drawings mm, and like maybe. one person... It's a brown ball of string versus a brown you know or i guess there could have been maybe they did cut a joke where they opened it like and actually your entire thing was just a ball of string it wasn't that but but then that wouldn't work because we saw he put stuffed papers yeah. in there yeah yeah i don't know hmm. I, we'll uh, never know. <laughs> I do love how he shoved a bunch of, earlier before, just his, just shove all the papers in there, tears it up, you tape it all up and just pray to God it works. Like that's, <laughs> that, I uh, I had that stance a lot with bosses and uh, handing things in. I'm just like, oh, just take it. I pray, I pray this works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Homer is then given the job of uh, selling out his friends. Lisa's very anti-government in this episode, yeah, too. I was yeah. kind of surprised. Yeah. Well, she's really ambivalent about this stuff. And like, they, she can never decide whether or not she's like a goody-goody or, or a rebel or whatever. And that's, I think, kind of like the purpose of her character is to kind of embody that. Both the childlike faith in the system and also the sort of the realization that actually things are corrupt. Like Lisa goes to Washington is obviously the most... Oh, Oh, yeah. you know <laughs> it is it's like the the early episode <laughs> yeah i mean on, on Chapo, like we say that elizabeth warren's biggest problem is that she's elisa mm. ah, yes very yeah. true she's like a goody goody and she thinks that she's shocked when people don't play by the rules she's a little <laughs> bit naive she still has faith in things she doesn't ever like get bitter about stuff obviously but it's almost like she just walked out of like a seventh grade civics class or something <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I had read a quote of from Elizabeth Warren recently. It was an old quote, but I had not heard it before, where she talks about why she was a Republican and then she quit. And she was like, well, yeah, mm-hmm. I saw the the uh, the system wasn't working and the capitalism wasn't the way they said it was. I was like, you were like, like how did you, you were fall quite an adult yeah. when you realized yeah, that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But I, She's I, very naive, yeah. I wanted to take that as an earnest statement. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she's very earnest. And that's the other thing about, like, Lisa. She's guileless. And so is Elizabeth Warren. I, I believe she believes what she says. <laughs> Maybe that's why Lisa turns to an anti-government person after telling Homer to pay his taxes on time now. Now when she mm-hmm. sees Homer being put into uh, service of the government, <laughs> she's like, hey, this is wrong. Now your government yeah, does. Yeah. This wire he's wearing is very obvious, but less obvious than the giant hat he wore. See, yeah. To spy on a poo. <laughs> Which is a better joke, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is one of these things that comes up in season nine a few times. We're like, I think they sort of did this joke before. Not that they're intentionally repeating mm-hmm. themselves, but it's just, there's only so many things you can joke about. And it's a, it's a less crazy version of that. Yeah. I do like Homer's posing of holding his stomach to yeah. uh, keep it upright. I do like that. <laughs> <laughs> the also, man, the, to let you know this is 98, there's like, does this make me look fat joke? Like, that is a very 1998 mm. uh, yeah, 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 It's very much of the taste like chicken variety of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also like how when Homer asked them, uh, w- what's the signal to get out? They just close the door on him. Like, we find out later yeah. he does have a suicide pill. So, uh, 
Ah, you might have forgotten. Right, about yeah, that. he's 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 fundamentally very childish and scared throughout <laughs> this entire ordeal, which is like um, it's why it's funny. It's <laughs> funny watching him being nervous and incompetent. Uh, in this next clip, Homer selling out his friends. I love this whole talk. This is again the the weight of the series really being felt here yeah. as they go over previous episodes and a rare speaking role for Charlie. Yeah, he he only as we find out he only gets to speak when horrible things are about <laughs> to happen to. That's true. <laughs> Hey, it's you watching the ball game. Looks like a good one. Any of you involved in any illegal activity? Because I could sure go for some. Oh, God. How about you, Lenny? Testing, testing, Lenny. You saying you want to commit a crime, Homer? Maybe, but first I need to hear about some other crimes to get me fired up. You mean like the time you was running moonshine out of your basement? Oh, that telemarketing scam you pulled? Uh, you like those, but involving you. Oh, you, you mean like the time Barney beat up George Bush? Barney? That was me. And I'd do it again. <laughs> Why stop there, Homer? My militia has a secret plan to beat up all sorts of government <laughs> officials. That'll teach them to drag their feet on high-definition TV. You're under arrest for conspiracy. <laughs> hey, how did they finger Charlie? Somebody must have ratted him out. Uh, that's ridiculous, Mo. And transmission. <laughs> Charlie is really a single issue voter when it comes to HGTV. And it's yeah. true. It's true. The government didn't do the changeover until 10 years ago. So 10 years after this episode is when the SD signal stopped being transmitted. Who knows how fast it would have gone if his militia had carried out its terrorist plot. <laughs> Japan was way ahead of us. On they that. really were. We, we were behind They Japan. usually are. <laughs> Though now the idea of Charlie running a militia is a little less funny to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess even then in '98, it's post the uh, Oklahoma mean, City bombing. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. But yeah, militias were more dangerous in the '90s than they are now. Like yeah. they had bigger numbers, and the Southern Poverty Law Center hadn't sued the majority of the big ones out of existence. Like people kind of forget. Like there was a heavily armed right wing in the '90s that completely dwarfs whatever we have now. Maybe we have Facebook to thank for. Dur- D- distracting them with memes and their <laughs> other groups there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? As long as they're like on Reddit, maybe just like keep them busy with that and then they won't stockpile the guns if there's whatever we have to do to defuse that. <laughs> I also like that Homer is just proud. He's like, I'd beat him up a second time if I could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah, and Charlie, he, he would appear other times, but pretty much when they just need another body in a either the bar or at the power plant. He was sucked away in a tube previously, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. For, uh, for asking for minor safety regulations. <laughs> Maybe that's what radicalized him, you know? <laughs> After he got back from wherever he went to uh, yeah, some vaguely foreign country. Foreign place, yeah. To be read as Middle Eastern, certainly, but uh, let's not dig farther. Homer sells out Charlie. He's apparently going away for a long time, which, hey, that's, you know, d- disarms a militia. Good good there. Homer, then, there's, uh, like, the duck feeding scene is definitely a JFK reference. JFK movie mm-hmm. reference yeah, there. Yeah. Then Homer immediately sells out Marge. Like, this is one of the many mean Marge jokes in the show. Under the threat of taking a walk. Yes, yeah. I mean, I do get mad when an unplanned walk happens I'm like you know what this we should have been told me we were doing this walk so they go to watch their film i do like the joke that cheese is the code word i just think it's le- it's made slightly less funny by the callback to it later i think it works better like you know that it yeah you know it's gonna happen yeah you should have just let it hang you yeah. didn't have to bring a poo in for it <laughs> they kind of over explain the joke the yeah end. yeah i usually they have a little more faith in a joke like that on the show so it, it kind of surprised me but uh here's the film strip part one that homer watches mr simpson please cover your ears while i say the secret access word cheese <laughs> Good morning, Agent Johnson. The film you are about to see is top secret and contains adult situations. In 1945, the people of Europe struggled to rebuild following the war. (laughs) Shut up, Simpson. To ease this crisis, President Truman promised relief. American tax dollars will help our allies who fought so poorly (laughs) and surrendered so readily. To make good on this drunken boast, Truman authorized the one-time printing of the largest denomination currency ever, a trillion-dollar bill. Ooh, a trillion-dollar bill. That's a spicy meatball. 
The man chosen to deliver this precious cargo to Europe was America's wealthiest and therefore most trustworthy citizen, C. Montgomery Burns. That was the second instance of people cheering inappropriately in this yes, episode. Yeah. I love it every time. Like, you just insulted basically all of Europe. Yeah, the victims of Nazis. They just are insulting them all as losers who gave up. What, too soon? Like, <laughs> So, but Amber, you, I think, are definitely a, a bigger expert on history than me. But from Googling articles, Truman, well, he didn't seem drunk. He didn't seem drunker than most presidents uh, pre-1960. Or most adult men. Yeah. Uh, my, yeah, my impression here is pretty average. I, I don't think that was a reference to anything in particular. I think it's just funny to call a, a president a drunken braggart, especially like a president that people don't necessarily have any memory of. I'd yeah. like to go back to a drinking president. I mean, he openly was like, I have a bourbon each morning. Like, yeah, I, well, no, actually, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting because Obama, he was the have a beer with a cop guy, but he was he was in between, you know, AA George W. Bush and apparent teetotaler Trump. I don't really believe that, but uh, he says he's never had a drink of alcohol in his life. Yeah. Well, we had born again George W. Like, yeah, no, I mean, like, presidents should be drunk. <laughs> uh, yeah, Truman was uh, the, the very least they could find thing of Tr- Truman saying that he had a bourbon every morning. That's just how he got the day started as president. Oh, wow. A breakfast bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently a b- bourbon was his his drink of choice. But yeah, Mine as well. In 1998, a TV ratings joke that also was a very specific thing. It's that, the second one I've seen and the first one was on this show. Yeah, the uh, the stabbing, the rating stabbing a man to death. <laughs> uh, yeah, I also like that Truman is just such a he's kind of a smug jerk about it and, and also that he's so full of pride that he prints himself on the trillion dollar bill. Yeah, well. yeah. And like looking like a dumb, triumphant <laughs> idiot. <laughs> and uh, and also the idea that the most trusted man in the in America is the wealthiest. Wealthiest, I, I love yeah. That that's a good that's a good class war joke, you know. <laughs> Obviously he's so rich now, he wouldn't steal more money. <laughs> right, right. And I had to Google this, but I do believe the prime ministers or the foreign leaders, the trio of them, are drawn to look like the the post war leaders of England, Spain, oh, really? and, uh, and France. Definitely the Brit looks a bit like Anthony Eden and mm. yeah but they all look the same <laughs> they're all mustachioed uh, thin man that's why Churchill <laughs> stands out because he's like the one who isn't a tall mustachioed now man. he liked to drink <laughs> yeah yeah he did uh, but yes uh, let's let's hear the second part of that film strip unfortunately the money never arrived well this is a kick in the knickers should we complain to somebody no I say we just act snooty to Americans forever. I agree. This film will self-destruct if not properly stored. (laughs) We believe Burns still has that bill hidden somewhere in his house. But all we've ascertained from satellite photos is that it's not on the roof. We're hoping that as his trusted employee, you can help lead us to it. But Mr. Burns gave me my job. And he hasn't fired me even after three meltdowns and one China syndrome. (laughs) I can't betray him. I'm afraid you have no choice. Yeah, Mr. Burns, I did not see him coming upon this first viewing of this (laughs) episode. It turns into a Burns episode, and I love him. Though he is the very much the newer Burns of this era, where it's less about a cruel man. It's more like an easily deluded rich person. He's like cruel for two scenes, and then he's nice. Yeah, yeah, uh, not my favorite direction with Burns. I feel like he was very tacked on here. I also, like, I love Smithers as a character, and I don't think they made the best use of the Smithers jokes. When The Simpsons is making fun of like the cruelty and um, decadence of the wealthy at its best. It's like some of the best kind of glass war humor you can find. These jokes were maybe not the best. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I do. I do like that Burns though. They couldn't, I think they have a pretty good case the second he doesn't show up with a trillion dollar bill of, of arresting him then. So it's weird. They waited 50 years. That is surprising. Right. Well, I, I I did think the the satellite photos, like it's not on the roof thing, was it? That was a decent joke. <laughs> That's a good joke. Yeah. I did like that one. Yeah. Well, the the FBI admitting how limited satellite photos are helpful. Yeah. Um, well, and also like wastefulness and, yeah. and like absurd, you know, security culture stuff. Yeah, I also like that joke at the time because you'd see all these movies that would, you know, make up like, oh, the cameras can do everything. They can watch you everywhere. So then the opposite the joke of like well we can't see if you got a roof we're kind of screwed we can't see <laughs> yeah. uh the china syndrome thing is uh that is a reference to the jane fonda jack lemon mm. film about a nuclear meltdown by my count 
have three meltdowns and one China syndrome. He's definitely caused two by this point. It's hard to tell in the Frank Grimes episode, you could maybe chalk up three in there based on how mm-hmm. poorly he runs it. Or uh, or also when he um, has to order a new... T- uh, uh, Diablo Canyon? Yeah, from Diablo yeah. Canyon. Yeah, that, that could have, that could have been the China syndrome. But Homer is wrong that uh, Burns has fired him multiple times. He did it three episodes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I yeah. know. <laughs> he seemingly was rehired, too. Yes, yeah. Well, he's a forgetful man. Uh, uh, this also, this next scene caused me to look up what a remoulade is. I've never, I don't think I've ever had it. I don't eat French cuisine all that much. I it's, don't either. It's uh, b- based on Googling. It's a, like a French tartar sauce. I don't know. Amber, have you ever had a remoulade? Oh hell yeah! Okay, it's good. It's good. It's I sal- love French food. You it's gotta, sal- you gotta get it on the yeah decadent rich people food every once in a while. <laughs> is celery root standard though for it, or is that uh, that's? I don't know bland. what that is. <laughs> I I don't know the difference between celery root and celery. Sal- like, is it just celery? I don't know. I. I I like some fancy food, but I couldn't point out celery root on a plate. <laughs> so it's just a fancying up of tartar sauce, sort of like how aioli is fancy mayonnaise. I mean, basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking that the joke is that celery is such a boring vegetable that that being it is makes it a very unexciting remoulade, perhaps. But uh, actually, let's play the quick scene of uh, Burns is very mean to Smithers in this yeah. episode. Here you are, sir. Wild raspberry compote, celery root remoulade, and pheasant under duck. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, stop fishing for compliments, Smithers. Go home to your can of mushroom soup. Sir, a kind word now and then. I'm choking it down. Isn't that thanks enough? (laughs) Sometimes I don't know why I bother. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a good example of, like, that dynamic is usually very rich. Like the, you know, Burns Smithers dynamic and the the put-upon you know, gay assistant or whatever. Mm-hmm. I actually did think the pheasant underdog was funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a quick joke. The rest of the stuff, you just hear it. It's a mess of fancy food words that you think could be real or maybe aren't. But then it's like, we're putting a bird on another bird is funny. But the, <laughs> and they um, drew it too. I like that. It's, it's very yeah. well drawn. But the, they kind of don't know how homophobic to be with Smithers sometimes. Mm, yeah. And I actually think they do better when they lean into it and just make, <laughs> just make, just make silly gay jokes about him being like a sassy gay guy. Like <laughs> those are the better. And I think sort of more affectionate and not actually homophobic like jokes or whatever, but it does seem like they dance around it a little bit. And they, instead of making actual jokes where he's campy, they make him sort of fussy or he's something. Catty. Yeah, he's, it's more it's more fun when he's collecting dolls or something yeah, like or that. Singing it gives him a, some sort of dimension. Singing yeah. a Bette Midler song like he does later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and this, it's more that he's, this This goes more into the burns a sexual view of him, which I, I much prefer the writing of Smithers as a gay man who, among the people he is attracted to, is Burns. But yeah. others, uh, I like uh, Al Jean, uh, current show around the show, he's talked about how he would usually view Smithers as a burns a sexual as in he's if he says as Algin puts it if Burns was a frog he'd be atta- attracted to frogs it's just about Burns not so much the gender which I I really prefer Smithers is just one of the rare gay characters on yeah, the show I, and he's a big flaming homo that goes to like Fire <laughs> Island and yeah. like that that's a fun character and he has like dimension I think making him Burns sexual is one it's like flattening and two it ignores some of the best uh, Smithers being gay jokes yeah that the Simpsons have to offer a good affectionate anti-homophobic laugh at gayness mm-hmm. he's the world's biggest sycophant who happens to be a gay man so <laughs> yes fine. exactly <laughs> exactly and those things aren't are kind of not completely unrelated but they're not codependent <laughs> so smithers i who i guess would normally be answering the door i think for plot purposes that's why burns is so mean to him because the smithers like you know what i'm just calling home early today so that's why he doesn't answer the door when Homer arrives in the next scene. No, you're right. Like, Smithers will be around to tell Mr. Burns, like, this is Homer Simpson. Yeah, here's who he is. Yeah. Let's explain it. They had to get rid of Smithers early. Yeah, one of the drones from Sector G or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, in this, in this next scene, Homer meets with Burns. This feels like the last release the hound jokes that yeah. I can remember. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think this bit implies, in, in this next clip, but this bit implies that all the hounds are dead, that he just <laughs> forgot to feed them or they were given away or just... It's uh, a little insane. I think they could have done 
more with it because yeah release the hounds is now like a is it for simpsons watchers just like a it's like a funny thing mm-hmm. uh but like they didn't do anything with it they just didn't show up like you yeah. forgot to write a joke <laughs> the joke is nothing happens they they, yeah. they just shrug at each other just like, an well. empty threat yeah <laughs> uh but i i do i love homer's delivery in this next one of the um i don't know what to tell you <laughs> now what smithers hey you're not smithers uh, I'm Homer Simpson, your trusted employee. <laughs> employee, eh? What a pleasant surprise. <laughs> mm. A pack of vicious dogs should be ripping you to pieces. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Very well, come on in. <laughs> Perhaps I have something I can scald you with. <laughs> It'll uh, be a few minutes. <laughs> so, what brings you to my home? Well, Mr. Burns... You always come off as kind of a gruff, crotchety loner. But we both know that deep down inside... (laughs) Still cold. Mm. Let me get you a towel. I love Burns' very formal (laughs) insistence on maiming Homer. Like, well, I I have to injure you in some way. You're unwelcome here. Come in. Yeah, because Uh, he's like cruel and evil, but also he's very civilized, which is like a funny... It's a a good take on him. That's like a good... Like his just sort of disappointment and impatience with his inability to maul or scald (laughs) Homer is pretty good. I just love his, oh, very well. (laughs) Yeah. He's he's a billionaire from a different age, so he's still like, I have to invite you in. UK. I get one chance to hurt you, and if I fail, it's my fault. <laughs> yeah. And same with like he if he failed to burn his face with boiling water, he's like, Well, I'm get you a towel. Fine. <laughs> yeah. I did take the reply of, I don't know what to tell you to bosses. It's just a great like, what are you gonna do? Like, yeah. I can't yeah. I can't do it. Well, because Homer's big thing is that he doesn't expect to not be treated poorly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's you're in your right to maul me with your dogs, yeah. but he's also at a loss for words. <laughs> right. I should be running away from dogs right now, as as <laughs> or at least a robotic Richard Simmons. It should be one of those things. <laughs> Uh, and then as Burns goes away, Homer searches around. Uh, that brand joke, I feel like it should be something funnier than just a bunch of yeah. old man brand. I, something old timier. I but just don't imagine Burns eating a bunch of just like, you know, normal brand you'd buy from the supermarket. But it is a return of the very 19th century pantry that was in Homer the Smithers. They just reused the design. Of I love it, Smithers. though. Yeah, it's really good. I like it. Also, Homer should know what's in there because he, yeah. he was just Smithers. It's a there. cereal that got set on fire, right? <laughs> when he poured You're it. You're right. Yeah, yeah that was. Okay. Okay, there's there's continuity here. Um, <laughs> That's uh, what we care the most about on the show. It's not what's funny. It's continuity. <laughs> so yeah, then Homer Homer is uh, using up his suicide pill like twice. He's just so excited to use it. They should not have given it to him. And then we get a reference to Collier's Magazine, which... Um, I, I love it. <laughs> This is this is very much a Matt joke. Oh yeah, and to some, yes. and, and to, and to some degree a Felix joke too. Things that just don't exist anymore are hilarious to Felix and Matt. <laughs> just like old, irrelevant, anachronistic things are funny to both of them, just all by themselves. That that it absolutely tickles them. So like I I think about like when he. <laughs> Oh God! He also brings up some starlet. Oh, Spring uh, Byington. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, try saying no to her. That's very much a a, a matter of, or a Felix joke as well. Yeah, like, call- and it's the kind of joke that you don't totally need to get the reference for to laugh at. Mm-hmm. Kind of, if you just barely know know it as a reference, like it's almost funnier because it's just like <laughs> this is old people shit, and that's what's funny about it. Yeah, Collar's Magazine last published in 1957. I think I knew about it because when I was getting into classic movies, you would see like, oh, where did this story come from? It's based on a story originally published in Collier's Magazine. Like ah. so many like Hitchcock things were from Collier's yeah. Magazine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those... I think I think it was probably some old movie I had, I had heard, it, heard of it from. But it also just, it just sounds old. It's just funny. <laughs> and like his weird delight at it, like, you know, like he's Joan Crawford showing off his estate or well, something. Like, like, it's, just, it's just like a very funny, like vanity overcomes him. Is it like Star Snoop? Yeah, Star Snoop. Yeah. <laughs> I love that he's been, uh, you get the sense he's been waiting a hundred years yeah. to finally be interviewed by Colliers. And <laughs> I will say, yeah, coming. flattered Burns is a new Burns I like. Yeah. Like, he's very yeah, flattered. Yeah. Uh, that he has all these stories to tell. I, no, those, uh, I do love when Chrisman on the podcast, he'll make a reference like this. And 
there's kind of no reaction to it. And then he's like, come on. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. When they don't land, he just gets angry. <laughs> Those are funny. But yeah, it's actually, I do like Burns in this next, in this next clip is excitement over call years. Yeah. And what his vanity is, is great. Yeah. yeah. What is this? What are you doing? Um, uh, uh. No, I get it. <laughs> I'm on to you. You're from Collier's Magazine, aren't you? Are you going to put me in Star Snoop? Uh, yeah, sure. That thing. Well, I won't go without a fight, wink, wink. <laughs> Let me show you around. I hope you don't mind a little walking. Uh. <laughs> Here's a scoop for your readers. Oh, wait, yeah, and then comes the Spring Bryington line, yeah. Who was one of the fir- the earliest actresses in Hollywood history. Like, she died in 1977 <laughs> at quite an old age. She, yeah, I think Hollywood was the second part of her career, actually. Like, yes. 1930 like was her first movie. Yeah, yeah. Like stage and radio and stuff like stage that. Stage and radio. That's uh, so that he would know her then is uh, is quite funny. Yeah, there's it's a lot of... It's just funny, yeah. There's a ton of old-timey <laughs> stuff. He talks about the new Packard when uh, the taxi oh, yeah. picks yeah. up yeah. in Cuba. It's all, it's all very good. And uh, Ed and Chaplin's, I didn't know this until they mentioned it on the commentary, Cha- Charlie Chaplin's body was stolen after his death. Oh. Uh, he died in uh, over the Christmas holidays of 1977. By 78, he was buried and then almost immediately exhumed and had his body stolen. The robbers buried him in their backyard but got caught in May and returned the body. So, uh, Oh, Ch- my God. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I didn't get that reference at all. I didn't know that at all. I, so that implies that Burns bought the clothes off of him before they returned the corpse. Uh, what were their plans for this the, corpse? He, it, it, yeah, he's the person that exhumed the corpse. <laughs> uh, well, he's these two guys who apparently were in a real financial bind, and they just thought like this would this would pay off some debts. See uh, Charlie they, Chaplin's corpse. <laughs> How uh, are you going to unload? Yeah, <laughs> they they seem to think they've extorted out of the family. I think just you get one bone at a time. <laughs> oh God. Uh, uh, Homer is just like ew, <laughs> like, uh, and then Burns thinks it's something to be very proud of that he stole a dead man's clothes. Homer is smart enough to realize that uh, Burns robbed the corpse. Yes, yeah. <laughs> in, that, yeah. in that joke. Uh, and then we get kind of like a Disney's Hall of Presidents moment with the the Hall of Patriots. I, I like that a lot. I've, I it it also feels like a very old money kind of thing of these guys to brag about how their ancestors were in the founding fathers or something when they very likely were like Sam Adam his third best friend or something <laughs> yeah or if they actually were they, they like owned slaves and exploited people <laughs> yeah i'm guessing the slave ownership is not mentioned in the hall of presidents then. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> or hall uh the, sorry the the hall of patriots uh, right and uh, though i do like that he's proud that they killed the fenway flounder yeah. like, it was <laughs> <laughs> also the the depiction the likeness of montgomery burns with the trillion dollar bill like that is actually less silly than how ben garrison draws character yeah that's true yeah, yeah. that's really true <laughs> i love that drawing of him as the ultimate patriot yeah like, with his curly locks it's how they dream of themselves like the the uh super rich like him they do that a lot um with you know burns is you know portrayed himself as a a much more muscular and, (laughs) you know, Olympian style like figure in a few different episodes. And I like that they will intermittently show Burns as like sort of a disgusting, frail old man. I don't know. It it, it is interesting. Like when Marge paints him and all of that, Mm -hmm. it is interesting how they even give him sort of dimension and, and his vanity and his ego are, are, are sort of part of that. They don't make him into, I mean, he's evil, but <laughs> evil people are still three dimensional mm-hmm. and I like his insecurity and, uh, <laughs> and his, his susceptibility to flattery. I, I also think that that, um, idealized body was partially designed by Smithers. I'm going to, yeah, gonna, I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> Burns then also has a very funny line of saying like, Oh, it'd be silly for me to put the trillion dollar bill right there. No, I keep it right here. And he just, pulls it out that's so great it's a pretty big bag yeah uh and yes burns is caught and uh and homer has to make an important decision in this next clip <laughs> i love this is that the trillion dollar bill in his hand <laughs> that would be pretty careless of me wouldn't it i keep the real bill right here wow <laughs> that must be worth a fortune Nobody move. Quit the Montgomery Burns. You're under arrest for grand, 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 grand larceny. I'm not the thief. The 
government is. Every year you make hard-working Joes like my reporter friend here pay income taxes. And for what? Aid to ungrateful foreigners. Do nothing nuclear missiles. Tomb polish for some unknown soldier. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> you crooks in Washington had put a sock in it, punk. Silence me, but you can't silence Collier's magazine. Tell the people, <laughs> don't let the government push you around. You have a choice. Fight back. I'm gonna write the best darn article. Oh, wait. Ta. Huh. Take that, Uncle Sam. So Homer is being basically enslaved by the government, but it takes this speech from Burns to realize that the government <laughs> right. is bad. I like, uh, he is the highly suggestible type, as we've yeah. learned. Yeah, yeah, that's, again, like, what the thing about Homer is that he's very excitable and he's very suggestible and he's very passionate for brief moments in, in time. For <laughs> so a he's second, impulsive. For a second, he's convinced he actually writes for Collier's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was suggested to him an entire career. Um, also, good, pretty good uh, joke of three there what was it uh foreign aid to ungrateful countries useless nuclear weapons and tomb polish <laughs> yeah. good, good joke of threes there yeah. all three things were funny but the third thing as the, is the rule was the funniest yeah yeah to be you, that- you, you gotta balance it otherwise the whole thing just falls apart <laughs> Even the most like angry libertarian would not be bad about the tomb of the unknown soldiers. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's completely irrelevant the substance of of what Burns considers frivolous because Homer is just responding to his uh you know passion and his mm. in his oratory. And this is the second joke about tomb polish on The Simpsons. Oh yes, yeah. The first was with uh, what Doctor Nick Rivera's first appearance. He was yeah. selling the. Uh, the tomb polish. He was clean. Well, it spiffy can be used on anything, yeah. but it was used on the uh, grave of Edgar Allan Poe. Allen Poe. Yeah. Meaning they robbed his grave. Too. Yeah. They, uh, it's not at least his headstone. <laughs> I, yes. Yeah, d- defiling the dead is like an ongoing Simpsons like <laughs> yeah. joke. Yeah. There are two like defiling the dead jokes in this uh, act alone. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's true. Oh yeah, I mean like I think. One of my favorite just gags, it's not even a joke in that it's just like purely visual, was from the the episode where Homer is sanitation commissioner. Rod and Todd are burying their bunny and a oh. dead bunny just bursts out of the ground, <laughs> oh. which is literally, it's just, it's not even a joke. It's just a gag. It's all animation. It's so stupid and gross. And I remember just being doubled over <laughs> laughing at that I, scene. It's I also just, enjoy uh, Wiggum using the head of the town founder. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the Act. Bouncy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And they uh, love defiling the dead. Well, that anger over foreign aid thing that reminded me of like you guys on Chapo, especially I think you and Matt talk about how that's the chief canard of so many conservative when it's like yeah. that is hardly anything we like percentage wise. We're America- so cheap. Yeah. <laughs> we we don't give foreign aid to anyone ever. It's such a tiny it and it, it's almost always like something so emergency oriented like disaster uh-huh. relief. Like we don't do anything to help with the development of, of the third world or anything. Yeah, even, unless unless we are trying to sort of neoliberalize it, be like, hey, we'll build a school if you make it for profit. Even Puerto Rico is too foreign to help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I also I love Homer's excitement to write that article. He's like, I'm gonna write the best damn article. <laughs> uh they end the act with a cute gay panic joke of him putting yeah. the hand on the bottom Homer of the Homer is very one. much like a little kid in this episode. Yes. He's yeah. in over his head. He's playing pranks. And I yeah. I love how Burns just lets himself be... Ca- Homer just carries him away and Burns is like, oh, all right, you're just going to yeah. carry me. I mean, he's used to it. You yeah. know, he likes to be babied. <laughs> and uh, there's a couple as they uh, as act three begins and they drive out of the place. There's a couple of callbacks to recent episodes about Burns's lifestyle. One, all the peacocks on his estate, which yeah. you saw on Larry mm-hmm. Burns. And uh, and then Burns' driving outfit, which he was last seen wearing while riding that same car. Oh, I'm a motorist. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I was going to oh. say uh, when he gets his gas refilled in the Chanel oh, right, episode. Oh, right, right, yeah. Petroleum destillates was what he was Yeah, well, Yeah, once again. And also very, very Matt joke. Post Old haste. things are funny. <laughs> they just are. His they... Stutz Bearcat, a real car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> owned by Jay Leno. Jay Leno, of course, owns that he car. He owns more than one. We know of that, right? Of course, yeah. When I did a Google search,
search for videos about Stutz Bearcats. The first one was Jay Leno shows off his Bearcat. Riding on the LA, hi- LA Highway, probably, yes, I'm guessing. Yeah. Jay Leno probably has released the hounds button. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's, uh, I'm repeating myself from a previous episode, but it's just still hilarious to me that Jay Leno puts on all that denim and on the Tim Allen show, current show, Last Man Standing, he plays like regular guy mechanic. And it's like, you have been a, a ridiculous <laughs> rich person for 40 years. Like you're yeah. not normal at all. You're not, you're not, you're not human anymore. You're that <laughs> level of rich. You have an estate of cars, just cars. Like this is the funnier Smither scene in this episode. <laughs> the only, really the only time he gets to really be gay in this episode, I think. Faster Simpson, those jet booted G men won't be far behind. We'll hide out at my place. I've got beer. No, <laughs> we need help. There's only one man who can get us out of a jam like this. You'll be swell. You'll be great. Gonna have the whole world on a plate. All right, all right. Keep your top on. Why, sir, what a pleasant guy. (laughs) Sounds like uh, Homer's been reading too many hideout books. (laughs) His plan is the same as his plan with Larry Burns. It worked well with Larry. Hide in the basement and drink beer. Yeah, it did. (laughs) I love seeing Smithers in his, you know, pink overcoat. And then also the, like, his Malibu Stacy's everywhere. Yeah, the very pink uh, dream house he lives in. (laughs) Dream apartment. And he's ironing his socks, which makes him very different from Lenny and all the other guys at Moe's. Like, he's... He's living the dream. (laughs) And and he's singing. He's literally singing show tunes. And yeah. like, that's what we want out of our <laughs> Smithers is someone who's very repressed at work, model employee in a, just a closet case and a sycophant. And then at home, he has this secret camp life, mm-hmm. which I, I think yeah. is like very endearing. As Homer says, he wants his homosexuals flaming. <laughs> exactly. I mean, at, don't we all? <laughs> I love how Smithers, for just a moment, he's like, you've never visited me at home before, Mr. Burns. How nice. And then just gets technically made an accomplice in grand larceny. So like, his yeah. life is over. If, if there were consequences in this episode, <laughs> and obviously they're not, but were there the, them, his life has ended by, <laughs> by Burns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, they head off in their Stutz Bearcat, which is more of a burgundy than a maroon, um, which <laughs> Wiggum just it doesn't do. That's that, a good joke. Yeah, That's a good. I like that a lot. They head off to be away from the tyranny of Uncle Sam, the relent free from the tyranny, the relentless tyranny of Uncle Sam. I like that line. That's good. <laughs> and uh, the episode really escalates fast that they are. Yeah. They're going to run to Cuba. Well, they just accidentally end up in Cuba. They just got to get out of America. They want to find an island. Meanwhile, the kids find out they're apparently crazy rich and it changes them instantly yeah. which I really <laughs> love in this next clip let's blow this fascist popsicle stand <laughs> we'll purchase a small island somewhere and start our own country free from the relentless tyranny of Uncle Sam but I can't leave the country what about my wife and kids that can be shipped okay kids I want some answers where do you think your father would go with a trillion dollars my dad has a trillion dollars Wow! I can buy and sell your sorry ass. I'll give you a billion dollars to empty the cat box for me. No, no, Bart. <laughs> that money's going toward your college education. Who needs college, Mom? We're trillionaires. Let's buy dune buggies. The money destroys Lisa's principles. <laughs> that's just, good. Ultimately. Yeah, I like that. And that's when you like. That's when you like Lisa when she succumbs to her um, libidinal urges. You know, when she like <laughs> drinks the water at Duff World and goes insane, or just just. <laughs> you know, goes wild from becoming popular for the first time or something. Like, that's when you really like Lisa, when she just, like, kind of loses her mind because she's, like, this really intense (laughs) type A overachiever. And to see her, like, be let's buy dune buggies, it's like, oh, yeah, she's a person. Yeah, lots Mm -hmm. of people don't like that joke, but I do because it shows Lisa is human. Yeah, Yeah, She's also tempted. And also, you can steal from the government. It's fine. Yeah. We already, a few episodes, uh, about a dozen episodes ago, we already kind of judged her for not taking Mr. Burns' money for the little Lisa yeah. plan. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, she should have taken the money. Like, you get older and you're just like, 
fucking research, <laughs> sabotaging their shit. Like they could have a decent life. And she just, with her stupid principles that mean nothing, <laughs> we all have to model this horrible version of like austere morality for the purity of a child <laughs> who frankly is a little smug and judgmental all the time. No, I just, like, the older I get, the more I, the sicker I get of Lisa. <laughs> well, that 10, we said, we said this, this is repeating stuff for our listeners, but she could have given that $10 million away to somewhere else at the very least if you hate that money that much at least give it away so it's not owned by burns the very evil rich guy like there's nothing wrong with taking money away from rich people there's no such thing as dirty money there's no clean hands in a dirty world take the money (laughs) all money is dirty Yes, uh, it's filthy, both literally and figuratively. We need more coins. <laughs> that's what I'll say. We need more uh, coins in America. I I just also love Yardley's delivery of like, let's buy dune buggies. Like it's yeah. so excited. It's uh, yeah, yeah. And the way cute. her arms yeah. move too. Yeah. Like she's excited. <laughs> I, well, also she's correct. Like you know this recent stuff with Listy Huffman and oh, uh, yeah, their, yeah. those kids. Yeah, yeah. That they were doing this for their shitty dumb kids who just wants to be Instagram models. It's like yeah, just buy dune buggies. Why are you going yeah. to college? Don't bother. Yeah. There's no reason. You don't need society. Leave those spaces for people who need them. (laughs) That seat in class could be so much better used. Yeah. Enjoy, (laughs) enjoy your privilege. Like literally (laughs) don't try and live a normal life like the rest of us because there's only so much to go around. (laughs) They're trying to get escape with their trillion dollar bill. We get to see Burns flying skills come up a second time. It's a real Howard Hughes (laughs) move. Yeah. I like that. And, and uh, I, I love when they can get a nice observational gag along with plot stuff. So Homer trying to get the soda machine to accept the trillion dollar bill is yeah. very funny. I like that that's a lot. Great gag. And uh, and also that there's soda on the plane anyway, which is that's a, that's another great gag. They're flying away and they, they escape into international waters, which I love. The in this next clip, Homer was just immediately waiting to gamble the second they reach there. <laughs> get his dice ready. <laughs> Attention, fugitives! You are leaving U.S. jurisdiction. Turn back immediately. Or we will be unable to prosecute you. <laughs> we better do what he says. Wait. <laughs> we're now we're for international waters. Woohoo! We can gamble! Yes! Mmm, nuts. They'll be back. They'll miss American TV. Any of these islands would make a fine new country. I call president. Vice president. Ooh, there's a big one. And it has freedom written all over it. Sir? That's Cuba. Cuba, eh? Take her down, Smithers. Uh, you're flying the plane, sir. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> this was the uh, this was the era before Prestige TV where it wasn't cool to watch TV, and American mm. TV was infamously bad. Now it's yeah. supposedly good. Too, uh, there's too much. I mean, yes. we're in Game of Thrones mania right now, and yes. uh, I can't take yeah. it. I, I can't take it. <laughs> Twitter becomes Game of Thrones town after a certain hour. <laughs> I like the, uh, sorry, you're flying the plane. Excellent. Like, I like that. Yeah. That's also reminiscent. I, I, I hate to say it though. Like my, there's a better version of this joke on the critic, which oh, is pe- yeah. penguins can't fly. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I do like penguins can't fly better. <laughs> that's, that's always <laughs> funny. I, uh, I've learned from people who have move, uh, immigrated away, emigrated from America, expats, whatever that, uh, that this isn't true anymore because the internet means you could never miss American television. And it's just apparently on in every country anyway, so you can't just really need a VPN. Yeah. Uh, they don't mean. have it in Cuba. I will uh, okay. say that. Mm. Yeah. Well, all right. Uh, let's talk. Great telenovelas. <laughs> well, let's talk about that, actually, Amber. Yeah. That's another reason we wanted you on this episode, because you have recently, in the last uh, few months, visited Cuba yourself. Yeah, I went to Cuba. I'm writing a book about sort of contemporary socialism or whatever. And I thought, you know, there's this one kind of remaining Marxist-Leninist country that is 90 miles off the coast of Florida <laughs> that I can now go to. So I I, I went. <laughs> how, how easy is it to get, you know, permission as a journalist to go there these days? Uh, it's actually easier as a journalist. The thing is, hmm. you still have to, like, give a reason to, to the U.S. for why you're going. I went with friends, so I got a press visa. They had to put, and I actually kind of envy them for the, for this, because you can't just say you're going there on vacation, or even though people go there on vacation yeah. from every other fucking country in the world. <laughs> uh-huh. But they got to put that they're going on, on their official travel documents to support the Cuban people. Huh. <laughs> nice. Which is cool. I almost wish I could have put that. But like, basically, we brought things that aren't necessarily like mass 
produced there or they're harder to come by there. Like Pepto-Bismol is, is like harder to come by there. Or like little over-the-counter things aren't just in every store or whatever. So like, you know, they, they were, they had to like basically go on a humanitarian kind of visit <laughs> providing nice little consumer goods, but like nothing. It's, I mean, Cubans are fine. They're not fucking starving to death. They're not dying in the street. But you have to put that on the paper so it makes it seem like yeah. you're a benevolent American <laughs> ah, going so. to this going to this horrible third world country to support the poor Cuban people suffering under communism. You were right, and like say- basically, we gave our friends cousins um, <laughs> some. Pepto-Bismol. You arrive, <laughs> you arrive in Cuba and you say, I come bearing bufferin for the yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then like I, the, the whole time we were there in Havana too, we were walking by like open clinics and like we were in, we were in like the, the poor area of Havana, but there were still all these open like clinics that people were just walking into hospitals and like signing in because it was really nice weather. So the doors were just open or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, well, I mean... I guess I would also miss Tums every once in a while, <laughs> but like the actual healthcare is really excellent. Hmm. The the way this sh- it's re- obviously they made this show twenty years ago, but like how accurate is is the look of Cuba in this episode compared to what you experienced? Well, we were in Old Havana, which is like the most kind of. Uh, like crumbly part and it's still like very beautiful you can tell like you know it's a city has beautiful bones it it has a bunch of spanish architecture when you go into like the former kind of pre-revolution tourism parts it's still like insanely gorgeous and luxurious and if you again are coming from some other country you can stay in a luxury hotel and but yeah there's you know cart people pulling carts of sunflowers on the street and you know little restaurants with cafes and people playing music and it's um Hmm. Like a beautiful Latin American country. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Like uh, we we stayed in the bad part, and it's still like the safest one of the safest cities in the world. And and it just basically meant that they were doing a little more building construction, mm. and it was just gorgeous. They sort of have a sort of a light Mad Magazine touch with Cuba on this oh, one. Oh, this yeah. Like I feel yeah, like. Yeah. They would have had a joke about Homer eating something much more disgusting than donkey meat, but they didn't want to dehumanize the Cuban people. Mm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah. Homer would be on board no, with eating I donkey they were meat. They pretty, pretty respectful about it. And yeah. it had less to do with maybe um, they don't have food to eat, more to do with the fact that people eat different things in different places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah actually, I was going to ask how much uh, donkey meat is offered freely on the streets. There, <laughs> but, uh, There's yeah. not a lot of donkey meat. They're very big on pork. Um, uh, but I, I do love yeah. this, uh, this, this, I, it's just, just a tiny clip here, but I do love this scene. Just Homer. One, why this works great as a bilingual joke for dumb Americans is that it uses only words that you'd learn in high school Spanish class. So mm-hmm. you, you can get it yourself. And it makes it even funnier that Homer does not get it mm-hmm. as well. He's not insulted, though. He's being very, like, nice to this little boy. I like that, too. But yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're going to love it in Cuba, Marge. There's shredded pork everywhere. It's carne de burro. Nice to meet you. (laughs) (laughs) I just love that. Nice to meet you. So friendly. Yeah. Uh, and how many paintings of Ch- Che are around as well? That, uh, literally it, everywhere. Okay, uh-huh. they got that right. No, no liter- literally everywhere. And you know the, the like, you know, the college student wearing Che. Mm. The people in Cuba are wearing Che shirts everywhere. Oh. It is not. It is not like a corny American leftist thing. They love Che. They wear the shirts. <laughs> they love the murals. Very still big into Che. It's that I remember once someone telling me that actually St. Patrick's Day isn't a big deal in Ireland. And then I ended up in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day. I'm like, you're full of shit. It really <laughs> is like that. It really do be like that sometimes. And they love Che. <laughs> che is everywhere. His face is everywhere, along with other like revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. They're very, they have that great kind of communist tradition of murals everywhere and historic, like there's like cool historic poster shops and political bookshops. And you see people wearing the Che <laughs> shirt. <laughs> and, uh, like ad- adult men, not like college students, like guys <laughs> like, you know, selling bananas out of a cart. Well, and vintage uh, cars still pretty big there as well. They are guess, yeah. they're everywhere. It's gorgeous. They I can't believe they still keep them running. They are so resourceful. I mean, there's no industrialization. The island isn't that big. Mm-hmm. And the Soviet Union is no longer providing them aid because they don't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. So there was after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was they, I think they call it like the lean years. 
mm. or whatever. And there were, there were shortages and it was, well, the Soviet mm. Union hurt more than just people who were in, uh, you know, former Soviet countries. And uh, it took them a long time to sort of like rebudget their country and it, and it required some, um, you know, sort of liberalization measures that would have been considered counter-revolutionary prior, but they just like had to because they're mm. a tiny little country. It is amazing what they can do with these cars. <laughs> it's interesting to think that in the previous episode, the Soviet Union reunited. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Simpson uh, Tide. Simpson That's what we Tide, wanted yes. you to think. Yeah. The Lenin <laughs> must crush capitalism by so the Cuba should be Stanley. flourishing in this episode. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was Mark Irving is the artist they credit for all the great car stuff. He also did the, the um, car accident. Yeah, and and also the uh, the classic one of the boot on the car from the New York episode. Uh, that was him too. So mm, yeah. he's he's very good at uh, car art. Very economically combined their cigar joke with their boxing joke. If they if they got they, both in yeah. there. If they could have just got baseball in there, it would have been all the stereotypes. They only have one <laughs> act for all of these stereotypes. <laughs> you got to speed it up. They have like three minutes left in the episode. So yeah, no, you can tell too that they're trying to sort of cram it in there, which is like it's almost like this should have been two different. Different developed <laughs> yeah. episodes with different trajectories, yeah. but you know, whatever. You write the jokes first, and then see how if you can fit them together. <laughs> and uh, there's also, I didn't know this until the commentary. There is a very obscure '70s comedy reference in here too. Uh, so when the taxi driver picks them up, he is very specifically designed of being this kind of like slightly heavier guy with a bushy mustache and a hat on driving a taxi. Now I only know this because Mike Scully brought up that he worked for these guys on the commentary and this was an intentional tribute to them right there was a comedy duo in the 70s called burns and schreiber burns this uh kind of skinny irish catholic type and then avery schreiber the uh kind of new yorky jewish uh heavier guy and they would do this consistent bit multiple times on their uh show the burns and schreiber hour of a taxi driver who is talking to a man named burns okay so uh it's this really d- dense gag of like they create a cuban Avery Schreiber who is driving around Burns and Burns is asking him questions. You described his appearance as a, a Jewish version of Lou Albano playing Super Mario. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, I like that description a lot. If you swap out Italian for Jewish, that's <laughs> basically I mean, for our generation who didn't have that on TV, I know Avery Schreiber as a, the Dorito salesman of the 80s mm. before Jay Leno. Yeah. He's the pre-Leno. Though Jack Burns, you'll know his voice as the other Crash Test Dummy the Crash Test Dummy commercials of of the 90s with Lorenzo music. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's... Anyway, that explains a very, like, just silent gag in this one scene. I never knew A joke for no time. one, but it's on TV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it. And it, it makes sense that Burns would have been friends with Batista or that he would have... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And I also... I, I liked the, the joke of, like, Homer doing the thing where he's pretending that he has the same naivety and not just ignorance yes, yeah. as Burns. He's like, I did not. <laughs> that was a that was a really good Homerism. Homer has no clue Batista left because he is just that ignorant of Cuban yeah. history. I mean, he had no clue that there was a Cuban revolution. He yeah. had, probably didn't know who was in charge of Cuba prior to the revolution. <laughs> like, Homer couldn't find Cuba on a map. Like, <laughs> that's the thing. Is like, I like the fact that he's sort of pretending burns burns is old and homer's just stupid <laughs> it's very it's very sweet <laughs> burns hasn't learned anything about cuba in the last 50 years but homer just never learned anything about exactly it. <laughs> yeah uh and so then we get our appearance of fidel castro here played as they say on the commentary basically like ricky ricardo yeah by yeah, Dan yeah. Castaneda. it's a <laughs> it's a fairly good castro i th- these castro scenes are very funny which could you believe he'd live like another 18 years wow after oh this my episode? god yeah he, he outlived them all. Like he's the joke in here is that he's finally giving up and to America. But in reality, he, he lived to right. see all of his enemies die. <laughs> and like, that was the, I mean, that was, that was the thing. Like they were, they were the holdout and the Soviet Union had dissolved and Cuba was going through a huge crisis and they didn't know what they were going to do. And there was all this talk that they were going to become completely capitalist. So like it was, whether intentional or not, a very like germane and politically relevant kind of reference there. Mm. Yeah. Oh, hey, well, let's hear it. So you say Batista's gone. Did you know that? I had no idea. <laughs> in that case, just take us to whoever's in charge. <laughs> Comrades, our nation is completely bankrupt. We have no choice but to abandon communism. Oh, I know, I 
I know, I know. But we all knew from day one this mumbo jumbo wouldn't fly. I'll call Washington and tell them they won. But, Presidente, America tried to kill you. Ah, they're not so bad. They even named a street after me in San Francisco. That's what I was going about it. It's full of what? <laughs> Presidente, three men are here to see you. They claim to have a trillion dollar bill. Ay, caramba! <laughs> we both into the Castro plenty of times since uh, this yes, uh, yeah. aired. I didn't know what Castro Street was when I heard this joke as a 50-year-old. Oh, yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were lucky. I it was. Uh, yeah. I lived in the suburban uh, south, so I, I was not aware of it. I this, think in uh, 2019 now it's like the home of the 100 most, uh, 100 most wealthiest gay men in America. Yeah. 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 It's impossible. But it used to actually be like, you know, it was a historic gay neighborhood and it was, a, you know, a hotbed of political activity and it's a funny joke. Oh, I love the joke. Yeah. I, yeah. I just love his reaction. Full of what? I, like, I think uh, of that joke, sadly, every time I'm there to go to the movies. <laughs> it's uh, full of what? No, I, uh, yeah, as as a gay person, I, once I finally visited the, the Castro Street in like 2006, it was very, no, 2004 was the first time I went there. It was very special to me because like, I think, you know, not to say that America isn't an insanely homophobic place, but it's different enough now, or maybe I'm just used to it, that like Castro is not, the Castro Street is nice, but it doesn't seem as special as it yeah. used to then. Or maybe I'm just getting old and everything seems less special now. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, I think, I mean, you're right, things have changed like for the better or or whatever um <laughs> in terms of kind of liberal attitudes towards just inclusivity and mm-hmm. kind of acceptance and all those happy little like sesame street kind of uh, <laughs> attitude towards people that that we want in society but it's like oh the castro used to be cool and now it's just a bunch of rich assholes yeah that's uh yeah it used to be the place gays live there because it was cheap and they could afford it yeah. or now it's just the richest i mean that's silicon yeah. valley too i mean the, it's the peter teals and the other uh blood-sucking gay <laughs> rich men literally, literally blood- blood- yeah. <laughs> They're the ones who are fucking it up. And that's why, yeah. like, all my lesbian friends I knew, they don't live in the Castro. They live in the East Bay because that's where the, they can afford. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it, it's still fun to go to the Castro. I, one of the things that make me, lo- well, actually, my husband proposed to me in front of Castro Theater, even. Oh, that's sweet. romantic. Um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was very nice. And so, yeah, I have lots of warm feelings about it. But, too, when I walk around there, there are times I'm like, this is like Disney Main Street for gays. It just doesn't yeah, feel yeah. real. It's like anymore. the Mr. Show version of San Francisco. <laughs> it's getting close. It's getting close. I, uh, but still, if you've never visited it and you're a you know small town gay, I still think it has uh, magical properties to it. Too. Every, yeah. Everyone should go. It's like mm-hmm. a major piece of you know gay civil rights history. Like it's also like just go to San Francisco. It's gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, before Silicon Valley completely destroys it. Yes, yeah. see it before it's gone. <laughs> We're here in Berkeley. It's still safe. Uh, I love Berkeley. God. And it's also not, in case this joke confused listeners, it is not named after Fidel Castro. It is, <laughs> no. <laughs> it is named after Jose Castro, the Mexican leader of opposition to the U.S. taking California in the 1800s. So there you go. There's there's your history lesson. But I just Who says love, this isn't educational? <laughs> <laughs> I just love how mean they are to, like, the Castro behind closed doors, he's like, we all know communism's mumbo jumbo yeah. like oh, yeah man. yeah just like lisa uh, they're selling out their principles immediately, immediately yeah, yeah. <laughs> But they uh, they've got a new lifeline of uh, of rich American here, which it burns meeting Castro is such a clever concept for a final yeah. scene of this episode. But I like, like how thing. artless his trick is. Yes, it's like a yeah. bigger brother tricking a little sister or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I love it. And I also in this scene here, it's another of my favorite lines of the episode of Burns saying, "Let's move to your socialist place. I do want to be treated better because I'm rich, though." <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so clever. Yeah, I'll just I'll just. Play the scene. Oh, so the island's not for sale, eh? <laughs> well, will you at least permit us to live in your socialist paradise? You're talking about Cuba? Exactly. <laughs> All we ask is preferential treatment because of my fabulous wealth. <laughs> May I see? <laughs> see with your eyes, not with your hands. Please, we are all amigos here. Mr. Burns, I think we can trust the president of Cuba. <laughs> Now give it back. Give what back? (laughs) (laughs) That's just it. Uh, That's okay. Where was Smithers? 
He yeah. could have been his enforcer. I may, they didn't yeah. invite him into the room. I do like the Smithers. Sp- the only comp. This is also the other joke is that Smithers is like the only competent person. Yeah, and like he just never gets any respect or reward for it. <laughs> One of the funniest cuts is the smash cut to them on a raft. Yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, they, like they have to wrap things up immediately, just instantly. That uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, then that it's kind of a rushed ending. Yeah, very rushed. Yeah, it actually it does remind me of the Lord of the Flies ending of Let's Call. Mo, uh, yeah. or let's say Mo, but uh, they credit it to Dan Grady again on this as he's the one who came up with this quick ending, but I do like knowing again in this world of the Simpsons that now Cuba has a trillion dollars and it's like <laughs> the one of the richest countries on earth. I, I love mm-hmm. that. I do like the Burns line coming up. This whole speech is great, but I love yes. oppression and harassment are a small price to pay to live in the land of the free. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of all yeah. of those like totally pro-fascist pundits who are like, people care about freedom and liberty, <laughs> like as there's the principles we should all believe in. Yes, yeah. But, who cares what the government does to you outside of that? <laughs> right. Well, and they don't really have they don't really make value judgments about communism in this at all. They just kind of skip it. You know, they make a joke like we all knew this wasn't going to work or whatever. But there was no like, you know, massive repressive repression jokes. In, in this episode, America is the coercive, repressive bureaucratic monster. Yeah, <laughs> the monster, yeah. Which sometimes what it enforces is good, like taxation. And sometimes it like coerces some, you know, Don Rube like Homer Simpson into ratting people out. <laughs> Even like, you know, solid progressive Democrats in the 90s tended to be pretty anti-communist. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of surprised. So they just like didn't really have much of a, there was no kind of anti-communism. There was no kind of, there was no ideology president. It was just jokes. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if that's just how, uh, that's a real crystallization of 1998 feeling of just mm. like, communism has been so defeated, socialism so defeated, that mm-hmm. it's not worth our time to say we don't think it would work. Like, it's like, right, it, right, right. it's over. Like, there's no it's self-evident. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. End of, it's end of history, yeah. Yep, yeah. But yes, this ending here is uh, it's a very patriotic and very quick getting out of their cul-de-sac. I, but I, I do love the speech by Burns. It's hard to believe there's a place worse than America, but we found it. Yes, I too feel renewed appreciation for the good old U.S. of A. Oppression and harassment are a small price to pay to live in the land of the free. (laughs) But, uh, sir, aren't you facing some serious jail time? Well, if it's a crime to love one's country, then I'm guilty. And if it's a crime to steal a trillion dollars from our government and hand it over to communist Cuba... Then I'm guilty of that too. And if it's a crime to bribe a jury, then so help me, I'll soon be guilty of that. God bless America. Uh, yeah, and then there's there's Homer just just impressionable as always, just getting, getting excited. Yeah. It is yeah. it is a just say moaning, but it's also it, there's a commentary. Like, of course he's oh, yeah. rich; he'll get out of it using all of his yeah, money. Yeah. There'll be no problem. Yeah. It's just accepted truth. Like, yeah, it's uh, that, that's another of my favorite gags, similar to this in previous episodes, where they finally they get him for putting toxic waste in kids' playgrounds. Like, that's a million dollars. He's like, oh, okay, here you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to buy the statue of Lady Justice too. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. I mean. The, the Simpsons, it wasn't usually, it was basically never explicitly political in the way we think of political comedy being, but it was always class conscious, mm. which is something that like right now we have everything is political. Mm. At all media, all comedy, it's all political, but very little of it is class conscious. It's less interesting art. <laughs> it's less <laughs> funny. And and I think it. When you look back at that time period and even things like Roseanne and even Married with Children, mm-hmm. like there's no sense of like the struggling family that was like the center of the entertainment, at least like television entertainment. It's just not really around anymore. Yeah. I mean, what we have now are just eight different versions of Jon Stewart's The, da- the Daily Show. <laughs> yes. I know. Watch. That's all, basically all, it. Po- all political, no class conscious. It's like a very sort of shallow politics, and I think it makes for less impressive art and less funny comedy. Well, so many, you know, sitcoms now, they mm-hmm. they want to take away the idea that they, they want to show a happy, well-off family, or at least like uh, economically comfortable family. If mm-hmm. they were in distress, then they'd worry, well, the audience will be stressed seeing these people stressed about money. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. better as wish fulfillment to just show that right. instead. I think the last sitcom really about class or that a lot of class issues was Malcolm in the Middle. It was about like the family is poor, yeah. all they eat are leftovers. <laughs> They're almost destroyed at every turn by financial <laughs> problems. One bill would kill all of them. And I know friends that wouldn't watch yeah. it. Like that show is depressing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. And I, you know, had one of those families and it wasn't like, oh, I want to see myself. It wasn't even a representation thing. Although I do, I do think there's something to that argument. You want to see a lot of different types of people on television or whatever. I, I think it's just like those kind of conflicts make for better entertainment than like dad doesn't like my new boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's why Roseanne and the Simpsons were number one shows when they started, because it was like, how about these families? Don't you want yeah, to see these yeah. families now? Yeah. No, I know. Nice the Simpsons change. were constantly in crisis. There was always, there was always some, I mean, like that was the undertone of everything. Yeah, they kind of lost that over time too. The They definitely you know. did. But the Frank Grimes stuff, like I think he even was like, you actually do live in a really nice house, but <laughs> they were always precarious. Mm-hmm. They're always like one emergency away, you know, Lisa needs braces or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh yeah, to think now on shows, I can't stop talking about Last Man Standing, but that's what the sitcom like the popular sitcoms now or the reboot of Roseanne, they weren't about class consciousness. They were about complaining about snowflakes and Mm -hmm. PC culture and like that. They were about culture, not class. And even Mm. in trying to, it's, it's, it's putting the cart before the horse, I think. But anyway, this episode really funny. I do like this ending. Uh, it's, it's funny. There's, it's definitely not their like uh, tightest plot they've done. Yeah. I consider it similar to another episode. I like the PTA disbands where the Mm. story is stupid and doesn't make any (laughs) sense, but there's so many great jokes and gags all Mm. throughout and good lines from that's this episode. That's a good episode. pro-union yeah. episode, too. Oh, that too, yeah. Yeah, uh, this, God knows, some of the episodes got real bad. Uh, so, and I'm not, I'm not even a Simpson, Simpsons completist at this point. I don't know anyone who is. Mm-hmm. But I definitely watched, like, well into this season and passed it. And this one, I mean, it had, it had some really good jokes. Mm-hmm. And it had some, it still had some of that, like, you know, like Simpsons irreverence and, uh, you know, had, like, the kind of weird vaudeville gags and uh, acerbic criticism of, government and the wealthy and you know funny endearing characters so amber thanks for being on the show you are on chapo trap house which we love is there anything else we can find that you've done lately um you can read my writing at the baffler where i have a column called all tomorrow's parties excellent thanks so much for co- for coming on amber thanks for having me on this was really fun so thanks again to amber ali frost we love chapo trap house and her writing is so good too so check out that stuff and we really appreciate her being on the show and hopefully we can get the rest of the chapo crew on at some point mm-hmm. too uh two left we have at this yes. point so we're eyeing you guys <laughs> uh but yes thanks so much amber it was awesome to have her on uh but this podcast yes if you want to help our podcast and get all kinds of great stuff please go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons and for the low low incredible low cost of five dollars a month you can get this podcast and our sister podcast what a cartoon a week ahead of time and ad free and along with that five dollars a month you'll get lots of bonus things including limited series that will only be on patreon our newest one we're doing right now is talking of the hill a first season exploration of king of the hill you can get that and also things like talking futurama and talking critic at the five dollar level and everything else that we do that will be exclusive to patreon and henry what is our new ten dollar tier what is the newest thing we're offering at that ten dollar tier <laughs> well we have a ton of stuff there that you'll get access to but right now now, the newest thing you'll get at $10 a month is What a Cartoon Movie, our monthly animated film podcast. Back in April, we did Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and that uh, was a really great podcast, I'm sure. And our next one will be just as great, which will be chosen by our patrons. And you can only hear that if you are at the $10 and up level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. It is 1000% worth it. So as for me, I have been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. Find me on Twitter as Bob servo my other podcast is retronauts that's a classic gaming podcast every monday and occasionally on friday go to retronauts.com or look for retronauts in your podcast machine henry how about you you can follow me henry gilbert on twitter at h-e-n-e-r-e-y-g if you follow me you'll learn whenever new episodes or other content goes live both on the free feed and on the patreon plus i have lots of political opinions that uh, if you like this podcast you'll want to read more of them h-e-n-e-r-e-y-g Thanks so much for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time for Girly Edition.